Pat Campbell, uh, I should introduce her. She's a CEO of a, of a hospital and uh, in the, is it Gray Bruce now? I can never remember what they're called. Gray Bruce Health Services. Gray Bruce Health Services. And I'm, I've only met Pat recently. She's now the chair of the hospital's e-health council, uh, 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 which is one of the health councils that work for the health, uh, e-health council of Ontario and are the sectoral councils. And sa uh, Pat runs a committee together with uh, Sam Marifiati and uh, it's been very interesting working with that committee over time. Pat is an unusual individual, as you'll find out, and knows about everything there is to know about this health system. Hopefully it does you some good when submitting your budget. <laughs> Thanks, Dominic. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, just to uh, round out my perspective, because I think it's always helpful when you're sitting in those chairs to know kind of where um, you, I come from. I have an undergraduate degree in nursing and did uh, a number of years of clinical nursing in a variety of settings then an MBA, uh, and then uh, moved into healthcare administration. And uh, my organization is actually a network of six hospitals uh, that are in the northwest corner of southwestern Ontario. So if, how many people know where Tobermory is? <laughs> we start at Tobermory and we end just north of Orangeville uh, in terms of the size of my organization. Two and a half hours driving time north to south and an hour and a half east to west. Uh, and, uh, and so that's uh, my little corner of the world that we're trying to uh, pull together and make into an integrated system. So uh, that's the perspective I bring in talking about this. In terms of the uh, Hospital eHealth Council, uh, part of the reason I volunteered to, to take that on is because as a healthcare system, uh, we have to find uh, the next wave of efficiencies. We've been driving efficiencies out of hospitals, particularly since the mid-'80s. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, this is the key piece of the next wave of steps that we have to take, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, but that's why it makes it important from my perspective to volunteer my time to try and see this agenda move forward in Ontario. Uh, we are, in fact, behind relative to the rest of the country, uh, and that's a, a source of great concern uh, for a lot of us. I do want to congratulate uh, Dominic and the Water to Waterloo Institute because this is uh, a key issue for the uh, uh, next phase of development in Ontario is the lack of human resources and so uh, congratulations on pulling this together and uh, congratulations to all of you on being here. So the things I've been asked to cover off are a little bit on how the system's organized, how is our e-health development organized and I'll talk a little bit about Ontario because I can talk about what I know. Uh, why is this important? I've said a little bit about that and I'll say a little bit more and uh, what are some of the issues that we're facing uh, as organizations and as organizational leaders as we try and move on this agenda. Uh, because certainly as an industry, we uh, have lagged far behind most parts of the private sector, and there's some pretty compelling reasons for that. The Canadian healthcare system, hopefully uh, uh, Dominic's uh, proviso that this is going to be lots of breadth and not much depth. Uh, you probably will all know uh, all of that I'm going to say here about the Canadian healthcare system. It's about medically necessary services at this point in time. Uh, it's paid for by our taxes, uh, and the federal legislation provides a framework, although, as uh, we're all aware these days, that's getting challenged with the uh, uh, court decision in Quebec and the uh, political action in Alberta. Um, but uh, for the most part, health care delivery in Canada is taken care of by the provinces, uh, with a few exceptions. And usually the way key change is brought about is through some kind of incentive, and uh, certainly Canada Health InfoWay is working along that uh, track as we move on this agenda uh, for health informatics. The Canada Health Act, as I said, is the uh, major legislation uh, that uh, guides health care delivery. These are the five principles of, Canada, of the Canada Health Act, and many of these principles will be much better supported if we can put in place an electronic health record. Uh, much easier to uh, have portability of health care uh, if your information, in fact, travels with you, uh, and, uh, and similarly as you look down that list. Comprehensiveness, I think, is the one that we struggle with, um, comprehensiveness versus the uh, question of uh, sustainability of the healthcare system. Uh, and you've heard lots and lots and lots about that in the media. The great hope for the Romano Report to provide a guiding light on how we were going to get to sustainability. Um, some disappointment about that, um, but certainly I think there's a lot of expectation in every jurisdiction in the country that sustainability is uh, enhanced and enabled through the concept of integration, integration of the different silos of the system. 
uh, and hence uh, um, that's a really important piece of what you guys can help us do. In terms of the provincial health care system, these are the components of the system. And I'm not going to read you the big long list, um, but it includes everything from the preventative end of the scale uh, and uh, health surveillance through the public health arm of the, uh, of the system uh, through to public primary care, uh, community-based uh, primary care, uh, and then institutional care, whether that be long-term care or, uh, or hospital-based care. Uh, it includes ambulance services. Uh, that's an area where the funding responsibility is shared with municipalities. Similarly, with public health, the funding responsibility is shared with municipalities and public health. And you'll hear lots of municipalities, uh, certainly in this jurisdiction, that will talk about how there's been downloading of hospital uh, costs uh, to municipalities uh, as we've gone to them for greater and larger grants to support building programs or, in fact, major capital investments like uh, moving into PACs or other kinds of uh, informatics. In Ontario, most of uh, this uh, care is provided, um, supported by the Ontario Health Insurance Plan, or OHIP, uh, and that was established to provide that coverage. It, in fact, isn't an insurance plan. It's just a uh, method of paying out for health services, and that's part of the problem we have uh, with uh, the sustainability question. Some key provincial organizations. One of the challenges in the hospital and healthcare sectors versus private sector is we have a lot of people that take on bits of the responsibility of making the system work. So the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care is the funder. Uh, one would argue that it is the um, standard setter and the planner. Uh, however, um, um, some of those things uh, we keep pushing as a hospital sector for the, health, for the ministry to take a bigger role in setting some of those things uh, as opposed to some of the direct management that they try and take on uh, through some of the program areas. The Ontario Hospital Association and other uh, provider group organizations, so there's a whole series of provider group organizations that try and work with government uh, around what should happen in health care. Uh, that includes CCAC, there's a long-term care sector association, there's many, many uh, uh, provincial associations. There's professional colleges and, and associations, and these uh, organizations take responsibility for competence of professionals. Uh, and so when I hire a nurse into my organization, I'm able to expect her to do certain things and be competent in certain things based on the standards that are set by the colleges uh, and, uh, and the associations. So the uh, uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons would be one of those. The College of Nurses would be one of those. Uh, very key bodies, uh, but again, they have a piece of, of the responsibility for making the system work. There are some organizations that have been set up between two or more of those groups. Uh, for the Ontario Hospital Association and the Ministry of Health, uh, the Joint Policy and Planning Committee uh, is one of those organizations. It has been primarily responsible for the development of the funding formula and most recently for the accountability agreement structures that are rolling out between the ministry and the hospitals. There's a similar kind of organization between the Ontario Medical Association and the ministry called the Physician Services Committee uh, and again works on issues of joint interest. Uh, local health integration networks are, can are Ontario's answer to regionalization. Uh, all other jurisdictions in Canada have been regionalized for quite some time. We're just starting on this adventure and we're taking uh, 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 quite a different path in that local health integration networks will be set up but they will not take out the individual boards for all the community-based agencies. So my hospital will retain its board, it will work with the local health integration network, and the people from regional authorities are just shuddering uh, in the audience. So uh, uh, we're all curious to see how this is going to play out over the next number of years. And then uh, one of the co-sponsors for today, Smart Systems for Health, uh, is a very important agency given the topic of this. Uh, it's a provincial agency, and I'll say a little bit more about it when we get to the organization of the, uh, of the um, uh, health, development, health informatics development structure in Ontario. I was asked to say a little bit about hospitals. Um, some of you, the, this may be very much old hat, but uh, uh, given that so many of you aren't from the hospital sector, maybe not. Uh, what isn't generally well understood in many communities that hospitals in Ontario are generally private corporations developed under the Corporations Act. Uh, they are, there are a few in Ontario that have been cre created by legislation directly. Uh, 
Uh, Sunnybrook and Women's is an example where there's actually an act of the legislature to establish that corporation. But most of them are private corporations under the Corporations Act. Uh, so they aren't like municipalities. In small communities, often they want to know why they're not subject to the same rules as uh, municipalities in making decisions. It's because they're private corporations. The boards usually have one employee, the CEO, very similar to uh, most private sector organizations that you've seen. However, the board also ta um, takes responsibility for appointing a chief of staff uh, who takes responsibility for the medical quality of care. Uh, so while they're not an employee, they are drawn out of a separate hierarchy, which is the medical staff structure, uh, and take responsibility for the medical staff. Physicians, again, unlike what most people think, are not hospital employees. So they uh, have a relationship that's governed by the Public Hospitals Act. It includes provision in the Public Hospitals Act for two physicians on the board, but they are really independent contractors that work uh, using the hospital facilities, but they are not employees of the hospital. And so the rules of their engagement with the hospital are governed by the hospital bylaws and by the Public Hospitals Act. So very different engagement um, for that group of players in the hospital system, uh, and that has specific ramifications around decision making uh, and, uh, and, and change initiatives uh, being the most challenging of those. So there are uh, two, maybe three, depending on how you want to look at it, organizational components. There's the traditional staff structure that you'd see in any corporation, um, starting with your frontline staff and your middle management and so on. Uh, and then there's the medical department structure, uh, which uh, starts with your, your uh, uh, general medical staff. Generally, they would have uh, a grouping that would be related to their medical discipline. Uh, that head would be responsible to the chief of staff or potentially, if that's a subspecialty group, to a chief of that area and then the chief of staff. So if I'm a, a general surgeon uh, in a hospital, then that, uh, I'm a frontline worker. Um, my responsibility would generally be to the chief of general surgery, who would then be responsible for the chief, to the chief of surgery, who would then be responsible to the chief of staff, who's then responsible to the board. So uh, the hospital staff are organized in a traditional way. The medical staff have their own organizational structure. Uh, and then under the Public Hospitals Act, there's also a requirement that they have a medical staff structure. And if you want to think of that as their union group, uh, then uh, you can think of it that way in terms of there's, a, there's two, up to two members on the board that are responsible for, for representing the interests of the general medical staff uh, through the medical staff structure. Any questions on that? Because that's often a bit of a surprise for people. Okay. Uh, hospitals often have, and in fact I would say must have, uh, if they're going to be successful, a supporting foundation that will take on fun fundraising and donor relations activities. Uh, if you look around the province, hospitals that haven't had um, uh, foundations uh, generally have very poor buildings, not very good equipment, and uh, are very marginal in terms of the, what they can deliver to their communities. Uh, and uh, so from my perspective, this is an absolutely critical piece. This is a piece that was put in quite a significant degree of jeopardy and regionalization uh, in uh, some other parts of the, pro of, uh, parts of the country. So uh, we're quite curious to see what happens as decision making moves a little bit farther from the local community. And we've already seen some of that in organizations like mine um, that span multiple communities in terms of uh, the concern around uh, keeping, keeping money close to home. Dominic. Question that's always bothered me is how do you resolve disputes when you've got these two hierarchies? I mean, does everything get resolved at the board? How does that work out? Well, some of it gets resolved in the press. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is one of the things that, uh, that uh, well, certainly makes my job uh, a high jeopardy job. Um, um, many times the decisions don't get resolved or they get resolved uh, by virtue of uh, maintenance of the status quo. So when you're talking about change initiatives, like we're talking about here with health informatics, uh, it can be a significant challenge. Um, so uh, not a very good answer, but one of the key dilemmas in, uh, in running a hospital uh, in any jurisdiction. That's not isolated to Ontario or Canada. That's very similar uh, most anywhere you go. Britain tried to get away from that by putting them on staff, but physicians still have such political clout in the community that that doesn't completely do away with it. We have one medical staff structure. 
And in fact, we have a network in Gray Bruce across all 11 hospitals uh, where we have common credentialing across all of those hospitals moving towards a regional structure for particularly specialist staff across uh, the two county areas. So even going beyond my organization. Yep. The foundation's uh, funds are generally used for capital projects uh, and so not for operating. Uh, in terms of the amount of funding that we raise ourselves versus what's funded by the Ministry of Health, um, it can be uh, as high as about 35 percent uh, is generated by individual hospitals. Uh, most hospitals are around the 80-20. Um, so from parking or other kinds of revenues, they'll raise about 20 percent of the revenues required for their organizations. Okay. And so lastly, a key part of uh, running any hospital is we have associated volunteers and sometimes an auxiliary. And the reason I separate those is auxiliaries in Ontario were primarily set up to be fundraising organizations, although they tend to be melded in with the volunteers that provide, say, support to the patients waiting, patients' families waiting in surgical daycare. We found out just how critical volunteers were as a key component of our organizations over SARS when we uh, basically kept everybody out of the hospital that didn't absolutely have to be there. Uh, we found out uh, just how uh, dependent we are on volunteers, uh, uh, particularly in, in providing ambulatory services or services to patients that come in for a service today uh, and don't, don't stay in a bed. So they're a very critical component uh, of hospitals. I've said uh, um, uh, lots about this uh, uh, in terms of uh, hospital staff, but as you're looking at your health informatics pieces, um, it really is helpful to think about it kind of broken down this way. Nursing, and the reason I put nursing as a separate category is it is the single largest group of employees in a hospital, uh, and, uh, and so uh, they, they uh, have particular issues uh, um, just because of the size of the group. Other allied professionals, uh, and you'll see the list there. And then other staff. And other staff would be the ones that you would think about in terms of running the business side of the organization as opposed to the healthcare delivery side of the organization uh, or what we call the hotel services uh, in terms of, uh, of how, you'd, how you'd lump those together. Medical staff and other credentialed staff, there's increasingly uh, other kinds of staff other than doctors that get credentialed, i.e. not employees. Uh, for the hospital, so that could include dentists, it could include nurse practitioners, it could include midwives, um, so there's a number of categories of credentialed staff. Um, it, they can be, the physicians can be family physicians uh, or specialists or subspecialists, uh, so general surgeon to, um, as, as an example. They're usually organized in medical departments, I already said that, and uh, they are required to have the staff association, as I said, under the Public Hospitals Act. So that's it in terms of kind of how we're organized. I didn't say anything about the community sector. Um, again, I could spend several hours on how the community sector is set up to interact with the institutional sector, and similarly with long-term care facilities. Uh, that wasn't in my direct notes, so I didn't go there. So if you've got questions about that, uh, we can certainly talk about that because, again, as we're looking at health informatics, it's those intersection points that actually are the biggest interest uh, for us as, uh, as this stuff comes together. It's nice to be able to pull stuff together, say, across hospitals, but that primarily helps us with efficiencies in the business side of what we're trying to do. The care side is really helped uh, by the, the um, uh, seamless transition at the intersections for patients. Within the um, jurisdiction that you're responsible for, how much of the money that's spent on patient care is spent in hospital-based care as opposed to community-based care? That's a very good question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, he had a mic. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, my hunch is we're probably in the hospital sector with or without physician payments, um, probably about half. And the reason I say it's probably not more than that is because most of the physician service will be funded out of OHIP. That'll be a big chunk. Um, drugs are the fastest growing sector of healthcare spending. We have a very elderly population in my region, so that'll be primarily uh, out of the uh, Medicare uh, 
um, uh, uh, pot, and, um, and then the community-based agencies. Uh, and home care has been rapidly growing. So we're about a $130 million organization, and I, you've given me a, a, something new to look at. My hunch is we'd be about half. So there's probably about, uh, about $260 million probably going into my region. Interesting question. Thanks. So one of the things I was asked to look at is how is um, information communication technology um, organized? Uh, I've really focused here on how is the development of information communication technology organized, so I hope that uh, meets your needs. Uh, many of you will be aware of Canada Health InfoWay. Uh, it was created in 2001 to really try and kickstart uh, the electronic health record uh, for Canada and I think part of the reason uh, it was seen that it was important to do it at the federal level was because of those issues like portability uh, that are embedded into the Canada Health Act. Uh, so you'll see the mission there. Uh, you'll see that it is an independent not-for-profit corporation. That's very important if you're uh, going to try and get stuff done uh, to not be embedded in some of the particularly procurement issues uh, that tie government's hands. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, we were all quite happy to see that happen. And the members that are uh, on the board of that organization are the Deputy Ministers of Health. And of course that leads decision making in particular ways. In Ontario, uh, Dominic said a little bit about this in my introduction, we have um, an Ontario eHealth Council uh, that includes the deputy, it's chaired by the Chief Information Officer for the province, uh, and it's supported in its work by sector councils. Now we're just getting to the stage in Ontario where we're kind of saying maybe some of the things that we're doing by sector need to be better done or better thought about cross sector, uh, but that's uh, the current state. So the council that I chair is the Ontario Hospital eHealth Council. Uh, there's a similar one for the community, the Continuing Care Council, uh, and one for labs, one for physicians, uh, and the Public Health eHealth Council is also now up and running. Uh, and these are some of the other ones that are contemplated. Yep. So just a point of clarification, the Ontario eHealth Council, is, is it the CIO for the province or the CIO of health? You're right, CIO of health. For the in province. my understanding was Laurel's job had been split, and that's, I, I thought it was now Roger Gerard was, was, was chairing as the chief eHealth strategist? Well, Roger's the chief e-health strategist. I haven't heard, actually, who's chairing, so your uh, information is ahead of, I think, formal yeah. announcements. My, my understanding from talking to Roger is they've split Laurel's job into three, so they've taken social services into a new CIO. There'll be a CIO for health, and then the chief e-health strategist now becomes an ADM-level position. And that's really critical because what that does is it elevates e-health now to the same level as the, dep the, so the ADM for... Uh, health services or the ADM for long-term care, and so that shows you the priority that Ontario is giving to e-health. Well, we're hoping that's what it means, but as I said, the formal announcement to my understanding isn't out yet, so that's part of why I'm, I'm hedging a little bit, because I too have heard the same story, but, uh, but it hasn't been formally announced. Dominic? Just a quick comment. Anybody else that has an explanation or things like that where we don't know the answer, please say it, and that mm -hmm. way we'll all learn it. That's very important. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So the focus for the Ontario eHealth Council is supposed to be around what's the shared vision and what's the shared strategy. Um, there's, there's lots to do, let's put it that way. Uh, and so uh, um, certainly um, having sat on the hospital eHealth Council for a period of time, uh, I think there's still more work needs to be done in Ontario around that. The latest diagram I saw for that also showed there was now a, um, a board for the eHealth agency. Health agency. Uh, yeah, Our systems for health? Well, they've actually, the latest one that I saw from Pat Jesselon, she presented back in January, and that Roger showed me a couple weeks ago, uh, had the, there was another board that had been created, and SSHA has now got a broader mandate. They changed the legislation, yes. right? And so they're, they're actually referring to it on some of the diagrams I've seen as an e-health agency, because they, can, they now have the application mandate as well as the infrastructure mandate. Yes. And that there's been a separate board that had been created, all right, that reported directly to the deputy minister, if I remember correctly, yeah. uh, in addition that's the uh, one up at the top, Smart Systems for Health. Yeah, well, they reported up to another agent, with, through another board. That was my understanding. Yes, so that Smart was... Systems for Health has its own board. Currently, yeah. the chair of that's vacant, uh, and it is in the process of reconfiguring itself. And uh, again, we'll see how that all translates out as, uh, as it's implemented. Historically in Ontario, projects have arisen out of the sectors or out of the individual departments and divisions within the ministry. 
Uh, and I think the intent with some of these changes is, in fact, to uh, allow it to be more comprehensive and less um, siloed uh, as the strategy uh, it continues to evolve. Um, so we're, uh, we're hoping to see that. It's been quite a while since announcement to implementation. So we'll see what happens from that. Can you define what um, e-health is for those of us that don't know quickly? <laughs> you should have done that in your introduction. I will be doing that. Uh, Dominic's going to do that later, but I'll give you my interpretation. My interpretation is uh, the development of information and communications technology to support the delivery of health care uh, in this province. That would be my interpretation. And certainly my interest is, uh, is just that. Um, so OHIS, one of the key things that uh, I think we would all agree needs to happen for any of this to work is standards and standards development. That's the mandate of OHIS. Uh, and uh, um, if we have one criticism of OHIS is they're doing great work, but they need to do it faster um, for those of us that are trying to put stuff in place on the ground. Uh, isn't that always the way? All of the work is supported by the eHealth office. Uh, who uh, reports to the deputy minister. The deputy sits on the uh, hospital, uh, the, sorry, the overall e-health council, uh, and the importance that the deputy attaches to this is obviously a key factor in success. You need to explain the acronym. Which one? OHISC? Standards Council. <laughs> Ontario Health Information Standards Council. Okay. So I'm going to move along. So I guess one of the key things out of this conversation you can take is this is what is today, but this continues to evolve at a pretty rapid rate. Uh, and, uh, and that itself creates its own challenges as you're trying to also try and move the agenda forward. In terms of regional e-health in Ontario, uh, there's lots of talk about creating local health integration network CIOs. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and. Uh, We'll see what happens next. The uh, local health integration networks, the stage of development they're at is uh, two board members and the CEOs have been announced. Um, they'll be spending the summer getting the rest of their boards put in place and then they will start to look at their organizational structure beyond that. Um, so in the absence of that, uh, what Pat Jaslon and group have done is develop a provincial e-health leaders forum uh, to try and bring some of the key uh, uh, people that are driving the agenda together uh, to look at the issues and challenges and, the, and the, to create the momentum of change. Uh, and then the, um, in terms of our council, we have now reconstituted our electronic health record um, uh, group, uh, development group, uh, uh, with folks from each of the LINs. So to try and, and support that development across hospitals and between hospitals and the community uh, as some of these other structures are getting in place. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of groups working at stuff at a regional level in terms of pulling information together, sharing information, uh, putting the linkages in place. Uh, and that's, uh, in fact, one of the challenges that uh, uh, we have in the province is a lot of that work isn't necessarily being guided by a provincial vision or at least not one that's really well articulated uh, and that uh, uh, has potential to uh, cause some of us heartache in the long run in terms of wasted investment. Yep. Is there anything in there, is Ontario looking outwards to the other provinces and looking at lessons learned from, I guess Alberta would be the hotbed of regionalization so we're not repeating key mistakes, I guess, that there's been are recreating the wheel, I guess. No, there's been lots of learning, uh, as you've said, in other parts of the country, uh, and we are looking at those uh, formally through things like Canada Health InfoWay. That's one of the structures that, that they're able to offer to us uh, is some of the formal learnings out of the projects they've been involved in. Uh, but even uh, at a regional level, there's lots of conversation as different groups are working on things to go and visit what's happening in Alberta or what's happened in BC around uh, the development. And probably one of the best examples we have of that is, in fact, the waitlist strategy where we're uh, borrowing heavily on what's been done in Saskatchewan uh, in terms of the waitlist strategy. So yes, lots and lots of, uh, of learning from other jurisdictions. And we can't afford to, to try and learn every lesson our own way. Although, as with every jurisdiction in Canada, it has to have an Ontario twist, right? We're all like that. So to get to the meat of the matter from my perspective, uh, why is this important? Uh, well, for me, the key thing is hospitals have changed, and they've changed a lot. Uh, uh, previously, and 
and for some folks, um, certainly in our communities, they haven't quite cottoned on to this, um, but care was relatively simple in many, many hospitals. Uh, and that is no longer the case. If you're in hospital now, it's because you have very complex needs uh, and, uh, and that cannot be handled in the community. So anything that can be remotely handled in the community, even if not comprehensively handled in the community, is expected to be in the community. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the hospital is really your last resort uh, organization. We tolerated across the system different standards of care. So there was, if, if there was litigation and you were in a teaching center with a trauma program, you had one standard of care expected. In a, a small rural hospital, you would be judged on a different standard of care. And while that's perfectly legitimate from the point of view of the um, colleges uh, in terms of looking at competence and looking at, at reasonable care, it's not any longer reasonable in the minds of a lot of our public. They want to know that you'll either be able to give them the best care or you'll get them moved to the best care, uh, and they want to know that that's going to happen. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's a really different environment. Longer hospital stays used to be the dorm. You've all heard lots and lots about decreased use of hospital beds and downsizing hospitals. We used to have a very big focus on providers, and this, in fact, is one of the answers to Dominic's question about how did hospitals and physicians coexist well for so long. Well, a lot of times we'd acquiesce to provider preferences. We can no longer do that. Uh, we certainly are being challenged on the efficiency side, uh, but also on the uh, service delivery side to be much more focused on what are the consumer of the services uh, interests uh, in this. And the uh, emphasis previously was on service delivery. You almost never talked about anything other than the delivery of patient care. Now it's much more on accountability. And for many boards, the concept is they're not only accountable for the people that are in those beds or in those clinics, but they're also accountable for the people that need to get into those beds or need to get into those clinics. So the concept of wait lists is uh, really bringing that home. Uh, but many, many boards had uh, already caught on to that being a concern that they had to deal with. Used to be primarily dealt with by lobbying for more money, more services. Uh, now it's switching to be how do we maximize the delivery of uh, what we can do with the resources we have available. Can you speak briefly to the accountability, particularly about accountability frameworks, because I think I've heard that's a, uh, quite a big deal in, uh, in Ontario? I'm going to in a few slides, yep. Yeah. So just in a little bit more detail, this slide is uh, about the uh, use of hospital beds. And uh, the bl bottom line, the dark line, is uh, acute inpatient hospitalizations. Curve continues to go down. We continue to provide less and less care in hospitals. And that's the trend that, that we want to see from a sustainability point of view. We're the highest cost providers in the system. The middle one is our average length of stay. Uh, and if you go back um, uh, in previous years before this slide, this slide starts in uh, 95, um, we had quite a precipitous fall in length of stay. Then it really um, uh, leveled off, and now it started to go back up. And there's a couple of reasons uh, people think it's going back up. One is that maybe we got it too low in the first place, uh, and we're, we're starting to be more sensitive to that. Uh, but the bigger um, um, theory is, in fact, as patients come into hospital, they're coming into hospital with multiple system issues. And so their care uh, length of stay requirements are going up because you're not just dealing with the one surgical thing. They're coming in with surgery, but they're also with their diabetes, their congestive heart failure, and so on. Makes it more complicated, and that's, uh, and that's part of the theory about why it's going back up. But the really interesting piece on here is the yellow line, which is um, day surgeries. And that line continues to grow every year. Uh, um, and this is one area uh, where when people say to me as a hospital, but you're delivering less care, this line. And I look at them and I say, uh-uh, I'm not delivering less care, guys. This line is going off the map. Uh, the surgical component, the day surgical component uh, has uh, far outstripped uh, uh, what we've lost in beds. Uh, and certainly ORs are one of the most expensive places for us to run. So in terms of, of, again, this decrease in hospital beds, we used to have an environment where if you had a three-day stay, you had a three-day stay. Well, more and more, the feedback to hospitals, based on what's happening in other parts of, of the system, uh, allows us to be a little bit more refined about that. 
So yes, you might have a three-day stay, but it may be coded by um, Canadian Institute for Health Information as may not require hospitalization. And what they mean by that is as they look at jurisdictions across the country, there's parts of the country that aren't hospitalizing for that diagnosis. So it gives people like me in administrative positions the ability to look, pull out that list and say to the docs, look guys, Lots of people in the country aren't hospitalizing for this diagnosis. We really need you to look at this diagnosis. Again, getting away from physicians being able to practice however they want, more scrutiny on what they're doing. Yeah. What are the factors that are actually decreasing the hospital bed usage? Like, I understand it from a business perspective, but what factors in the community are driving that? The um, key factors, I, again, my pers perception, because I don't have any literature right in front of me, but my, my perspective would be uh, better drugs. So a lot of patients with chronic disease can be managed better in the community. Uh, simple example of that would have been 10 years ago, we would have put somebody in hospital to start them on insulin for their diabetes. We no longer do that. Uh, there's much better capability to monitor in the community. Uh, and so some of the reasons we used to hospitalize people, we don't do that anymore. Uh, and they don't come back into hospital because some of the drugs are better. Mental health is a very good example of that, uh, where patients are far, far more able to be maintained in the community than they used to be. Uh, another one would be better care in the community. There's been a lot more investment in health care in the community. Uh, and then lastly is better surgical techniques and better anesthetics at surgery. Um, so that doesn't necessarily keep you out of hospital, although it does because it's allowed some procedures to be day procedures that would have required inpatient hospitalization before. Uh, but then less invasive or, or minimal access surgery has allowed shorter lengths of stay. Longer time in the OR, but much shorter lengths of stay in a hospital bed. Okay. Uh, and then the last uh, group that allows me to go back and question physicians on their practice pattern is the concept of ambulatory sensitive conditions. And again, this is uh, conditions where uh, a technology may be moving us in a direction that allows you to say, this no longer requires you to hospitalize at all. Uh, and so uh, uh, challenging physicians to think differently about their practice patterns. So the key piece out of this is it's no longer up to the doctor alone to decide how or where care is delivered for their patients. Uh, and it's primarily judged, though, on the basis of what other uh, uh, physicians are doing across the system. So it isn't uh, a matter of, uh, of me pulling something out of the air. It's based on the data that's being used across the country. But the really critical piece for uh, communications technology is that makes the pre and the post linkages absolutely critical. Uh, as we uh, move into this era. So um, we have a project going on right now uh, looking at knee replacement surgery. And uh, as, uh, in Ontario, there's incentive funding for the community care access centers to change how they're providing community care in the interest of decreasing hospitalizations or shortening hospitalizations. So we've chosen to focus on knee surgery. We do a lot of them. Out of this process, by actually formalizing the pre- and post-hospitalization phase in a very direct way with the community agency, we're going to be able to take a day off, a three-day stay, uh, for our knee replacement surgeries. That's a lot of days of care uh, out of the system, uh, and it will very much be enabled by uh, communications and information technology, just as a simple example. This is um, a piece out of the cancer report uh, that looked at what does care in Ontario look like for a cancer patient. Uh, and you could replicate this for a whole bunch of other patients, but really it's a series of waiting steps. I see my wait list uh, friend in the back nodding her head uh, because this is part of what we're trying to get around. And so my challenge to you is, it seems to me this is an area where information communications technologies can make something happen other than a series of waiting steps where you finish one before you start on the next. Uh, and certainly in terms of hospital care, one of the focuses in our region is on uh, care pathways. So as a patient, I know what the steps are. I know when those steps are going to happen. And it isn't up to somebody when they finish their step to think, oh, I should now refer this patient to a physiotherapist. And that takes 24 hours to do. The physiotherapist already knows at 18 hours of care, they're supposed to see this patient. So, so a lot of these kinds of, of sequential, historical patterns of care need to change as we try and integrate the system. 
I said a little bit about changing expectations for patients, uh, of patients of the system, and I'm going to give you just one example. Um, we had a study done uh, in Ontario by the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences called the EFFECT study, and it looked at um, cardiovascular interventions uh, at acute um, uh, presentation. Uh, and it established for the first time, in my experience, benchmarks for what was good standard of care, and then it measured every hospital that had enough volume and wanted to participate uh, in the study uh, on the same benchmarks. To me, we're moving much more in that direction where there will be a standard, either through research or through expert opinion, that will be established in terms of what is reasonable care uh, and uh, every hospital that's going to do that business is going to be expected to deliver on that business. Uh, and so, again, it becomes increasingly important that those flags, those benchmarks, those challenges uh, to individual practice are more visible and readily available to, uh, to providers uh, in supporting them in what they need to do. Thank, are these uh, benchmarks about things like, like wait time, or are they about number of er errors, or what, what do you mean by a benchmark? In this particular study, they were about how the clinical care was delivered. So uh, door to needle time was an example for um, patients that would come in with an acute cardiac, uh, uh, and were they able to get the clot-busting drugs within an appropriate time interval, as an example. There were other things like um, how many patients, what proportion of your patients were being discharged on certain kinds of drugs that were appropriate for that kind of diagnosis, those kinds of, of benchmarks. So these were all very clinical. Uh, the wait time strategy will look at some benchmarks around for this severity of condition, what's a, a reasonable wait time um, from decision to treat to treat uh, in terms of surgery or diagnostics. Um, so so there'll, there'll be different benchmarks, but the point I'm trying to make here is everybody's going to have the same expectation uh, in terms of the kind of care that they deliver. Okay? And then last, um, I think it's the last piece in terms of why this is important. Uh, we have uh, a shortage of providers in this country, and in fact internationally in healthcare. Uh, and, uh, and even if we were to ramp up, as uh, Dominic and his group are trying to do around information communication technologies, the lag time to train professionals in healthcare is so long um, that it's not going to be um, sufficient. Um, we're going to have some real time issues. Uh, and so, in terms of provider expectations, although we're not going to be provider centric in the system, we are going to be, need to be provider sensitive in the system if we're going to be able to uh, um, provide care in the future. So um, things that are changing is people want to have a reasonable lifestyle. Uh, and uh, where you might have in the previous generation had two pediatricians covering a region, they were basically on call one and two, they were prepared to do that, um, you'll no longer get that. And so larger groups with fewer um, days of on call uh, are becoming the norm. And so you may have uh, a group where they're providing coverage um, from several hospitals to cover a re region. Well, again, if they're going to have access to records, we need to have those records available through something other than paper if that is actually going to happen and be, uh, be able to be supported. Many physicians are opting to not do hospital work um, because it's too intrusive. So to what extent can we support them staying involved in hospitals by giving them some tools that make it less likely they're going to have to drop everything in their office and run off to the hospital uh, in order to meet the needs of hospital patients? So are there some things about, uh, you know, handheld technology, rules, um, standard care paths that can make some of those things easier and keep physicians engaged in hospital work? It's really important for us to be seen to be up to date uh, as professionals can choose. Uh, hence, I go back to my comment about foundations. Uh, and that uh, applies uh, in a very new way in hospitals to information communication technologies. Uh, many of the teaching hospitals are ahead of community hospitals in terms of uh, computerized order entry, results reporting, a whole bunch of those kinds of things. Uh, when those trainees come out, they're no longer willing to go back to paper. And I can certainly relate to this. I worked in uh, California in the late 70s. Oops, I guess I just aged myself. Um, uh, and it was very disconcerting to come back to Ontario with paper uh, requisitions and addressograph machines. Uh, 
Um, it was just very annoying to come back to that. And so we've gone from a situation where physicians and other professionals uh, balking at information communications technology implementation to where they're saying faster, faster, faster. I'm not coming unless you have this uh, in terms of, uh, of our recruitment. And that is uh, setting up an interesting dynamic between our older players who really want nothing to do with some of this uh, thinking and uh, our younger players. And so I watched one of my medical staff uh, go from being, I will never look at email, don't even ask me to look at email. And by the way, when I arrived in my organization, we didn't even have voicemail. I didn't know how I was going to do my job. Um, so anyway, he, uh, to now, to the point where he is now computerizing his office because he knows he cannot recruit unless he has a paperless office because he will just not be able to bring anybody in. Um, so that's a big flip in four years uh, for a provider uh, who's in his mid-50s. Uh, and so we are seeing the drivers change quite dramatically. Focus on population needs. I'm not going to say a lot on this, um, but the, there are a couple of drivers. We all need to be accredited. The Accreditation Council says we have to pay attention to population needs. Yeah, good, fine. But more important is the people that board members meet on the street every day where they're saying, why do I have to wait six months for my MRI? Why do I have to wait to get in for my surgery? I can't afford to wait to get in for my surgery because it means I can't work. Uh, and so there's some very real uh, issues confronting uh, hospitals around those patients that aren't yet in a bed or on the surgical table um, but are waiting. Uh, and that's part of where the population needs comes from, uh, is, uh, is taking responsibility not just for the people that are in care but the people that need care, uh, uh, whether that's pre- or post-hospitalization. Somebody asked me to say a little bit more about accountability. Uh, accountability agreements in Ontario are a relatively new phenomenon. We uh, had the first one uh, last year, and we're expecting uh, very soon the next uh, iteration. Um, this is, again, one area where we've looked very heavily at what's happened in other jurisdictions in building uh, accountability agreements. Hospitals in Ontario actually asked for accountability agreements going back at least five years ago. And the reason we asked for accountability agreements was we wanted to get away from this annual funding uncertainty uh, and the distress that that causes for our workforce on an annual basis. And it was felt that this could be a trade-off. If we were willing to sign an accountability agreement that says this is what we will deliver for this, then we'd be more likely to get a commitment from government on a multi-year basis. Great theory, but... Uh, so it hasn't quite worked out the way we planned, but the uh, reality is we did set up a task force three years ago through the Joint Policy and Planning Committee, that joint interface between hospitals and the, and the industry, to look at what should accountability agreements look like uh, between hospitals and the industry. And so they looked at Australia, they looked at England, they looked at BC, and particularly the Auditor General's report in BC. Uh, looked at a bunch of uh, um, work going on between organizations and insurers in the states uh, and uh, came back with um, kind of let's develop the prototype, let's develop the template. Uh, and I think some really good work. The nice part about this work is it really does start to get down to who's responsible for what. Uh, and um, um, so when I said to you earlier that uh, the ministry really needs to take responsibility for vision and planning and standards, um, everybody agrees to that. We also all agree that that's not happening. And so uh, the accountability agreements as they're coming out will be framed in the context that the ministry is doing those things uh, and that there are regional plans and then within that that the hospitals will be doing their planning within that framework. It's going to take us a while to get some of those pieces in place, but that's the direction that this conversation has led, is a very clear articulation of who's responsible for what. The challenge in the meantime is going to be if somebody's not doing what, then how do you have dispute resolution? Uh, and so, uh, so that's really been the crux of the argument between the sector uh, and the uh, ministry in terms of accountability agreements. It's not the concept of being accountable. It's the concept of being accountable in an environment where you're really not able to deliver on, uh, on the accountability expectations because of gaps in other places. In Ontario, Bill 8 uh, went through two years ago now, 
uh, which established the concept of accountability agreements and uh, the concept of uh, uh, repercussions to hospitals. The end result of that actually has been a centralization of decision making because uh, for the first time in my career, I'm now sitting in my organization with a deficit and with a specific prohibition that says I cannot cut anything unless I receive specific approval from the ministry. Historically, what I would have done is I would have balanced my budget. I would have taken this set of choices to my board. My board would have made a decision. We would have moved ahead on those uh, and, uh, and put the actions into place. And my comments to the ministry would have been, if you're not comfortable, tell me to stop because I'm an independent corporation. Under Bill 8 uh, and the specific direction that has arisen out of Bill 8, uh, we really have centralized decision making. I don't think that's the intent, but that's currently where we stand. So we are moving in the direction of specific accountabilities. And again, information and communications technology is critical to being able to get that data on a real-time basis and be able to manage to it. If you want to look at a great example of that, I would look at the wait time strategy and the way that that's developing and rolling out. Uh, because that's actually going to allow us much better information on which to manage those expectations. Uh, and, uh, and a subset of indicators. I mean, indicators, uh, when cancer looked at indicators, I think their initial list was something like 6,000 possible indicators as they looked at jurisdictions across the world in monitoring cancer. You can't, monitor, you can't manage 6,000 indicators. So what are the key ones? That's what these accountability agreements are going to give us. And to the extent that those things aren't in conflict with one another, uh, we'll probably be more successful in having an alignment between what hospitals are doing as part of the health system and what the ministry wants us to do. Cost of reporting must go down. This is a key piece I want to bring to you. Uh, traditionally, what we've done in hospitals is the ministry has, under the Public Hospitals Act, the right to ask for reporting on anything they want at any time. And traditionally what we've done is we've gone and extracted that data or set up systems to report that data, uh, which all sounds perfectly reasonable. But some of those extraction systems are things like sitting down with a chart after the patient's been discharged, after the final note's been dictated, so probably somewhere around 100, 120 days post-discharge, and for somebody to pull out of that chart individually the key data elements that need to be reported very expensive, very laborious, worked fine as long as you were doing 10,000 admissions a year and the only thing you were reporting were admissions. Well now, you saw that, that surgical day graph, well ambulatory care patients, so patients that come in for care in one day, uh, also goes off that map. So now instead of reporting 10,000 patients a year, I'm up to reporting 150 to 180 patients a year. 180,000 patients a year, sorry those zeros are kind of important, I sometimes forget them. And so the challenge of reporting went through the roof uh, as we started to report ambulatory care and ambulatory conditions. And we can no longer do that. So we need to start to extract this data in behind the scenes so that it, it doesn't complicate the system for providers, um, but provides real-time reporting uh, that allows us to actually manage uh, the system better uh, and, uh, and report it in a timely way. So, I've said most of these things, so hopefully, Dominic, I won't uh, run you over. I don't think I will. The um, information communication technology is absolutely required, in my view, for us to move this system along. From the patient experience, we need to get away from fragmentation. Um, uh, somebody looked at one of the CCAC processes, in tr I think it was in Toronto, and realized that the patient's demographic inf information was copied by hand 17 times in the process of moving that patient from hospital to a long-term care facility. That's nuts. So from an efficiency point of view, we can't afford this anymore. We need to get data captured once. We have a lot of problem with data quality because data is captured repeatedly and hence inconsistently uh, across the system. So this is a big push in my organization. I want data captured once and accurately so that, uh, so that they know if they don't get the registration data right, at the end of the day it's going to have an impact on hospital funding because that's at the end of the day where it plays out to. And I want my staff to understand that. And we have to have the patient information in a more timely way. 
The second key place where you guys can help us is on working together for efficiencies. We've got to get out of having two systems. So big push uh, in my region right now is moving to um, digital radiography. So we get out of having both film and electronic capture for images. That's where we are right now. Similarly, in the electronic health record piece, we've got to get out of having paper and electronic systems to manage. Because right now, we're managing both, and we're paying for infrastructure and requirements to, uh, to move that along for both. And then we have to be able to move uh, data between organizations. We have some challenges. There's tremendously uneven support to, from government in uh, moving these things along. Dominic's already talked about the lack of uh, key uh, human resource capacity. And we also have a problem with vendor products. They often aren't yet uh, either at a stage of maturity where they really solve the business problem we need to solve, or we haven't done a good enough job of articulating the business problem we need to have them solve. So when we bring them in, they make the care delivery process more cumbersome instead of more help, um, uh, simpler. Uh, and so we've got some work to do with the vendor community there. There is full support for information communication technology of some sectors, public health being one, CCACs or the community care access centers being one. The challenge that that creates is that to create a regional system of care, I now need to talk to a provincial system that's sector specific. Makes it very difficult to have those conversations, makes it very difficult for regional um, development to have a priority. And there's the whole issue of some for-profit and some not-for-profit players, and uh, how do you deal with those from a policy perspective? You're going to talk a lot more about this, but one of the uh, things on this slide that I'm not going to go through in any detail is there's a whole series of players that have to step to the plate for this to work. And they range from leaders. So if our deputy doesn't see this as a key enabler in the system, we're not going to get very far. Uh, in terms of getting the right uh, supports, whether it's policy supports or funding supports. We also need clinical leaders that are willing to take that step and say, you know what, this isn't the way we've always done it, but it's a better way, or it's a way that we can make better as we work with it over time. Um, so it can't just be driven from the uh, IT folks or from the vendor community. It really takes some clinical leaders, and you're going to hear from some of those folks uh, over the course of this. You need some people that are willing to try and explore the new business practices, the, uh, and the uh, implementers are, uh, are where I'd categorize those. The vendors, the researchers, and the teachers uh, are all uh, equally important. This one I've already spoken to. We've got, uh, we've got lots of products out there, but not all of those products are really where we need them to be. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, most of the patient care applications were built for very large organizations, and their intent was to streamline communications across very large organizations. Well, you now put them into a very small hospital, and all of a sudden, what used to be a simple care delivery process, Mabel, I need an x-ray here now, instead involves going and keying it into the computer. Uh, it makes it more cumbersome. It doesn't, it's, it's a challenge that we're going to have to work through. And then the big issue that's going to confront us very quickly, and we're seeing it with the digital imaging, is proprietary software uh, and hardware versus the need for interoperability. So if we're going to data share, um, people have to be a lot more comfortable about the fact that we have to talk to one another. And it isn't a reasonable thing to say, no, you should build your whole system around my world. Sorry, my world is all of Ontario. Uh, You've got lots and lots of areas where we've got challenges. I'm not going to walk through these in detail, because looking through your schedule, I think you're going to touch on lots and lots of these in uh, a lot more detail. Um, but it starts right from the very basic. Who's the patient? And let's make sure that we've got the same patient uh, each time we're talking about the same patient. Um, current challenge in Ontario um, and something that's uh, moving ahead, hopefully quite rapidly, because we can't go very far without that. Right down to, and I've got it at the bottom because it takes a lot of building the basement and the walls of the organization before you can get to where the guts of it really is from a patient perspective, and that's the decision support capability. The idea that you can build in prompts and rules that will help, help providers to provide excellent care to patients by saying, oh, excuse me, did you remember this patient had an allergy to this? Oh, excuse me, but 
do you realize that this is day three and you really should have ordered this by now? Uh, or this is the antibiotic of choice for this diagnosis? Prompts that help um, providers to stay on top of best practices uh, and use that in their care delivery decision making. I was asked for a list of references. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff on where the health system's going and some of the challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, other areas to go, you've got the Health Canada website. Um, oh, I actually updated this slide. I'll uh, send it to you, Shirley. Um, Smart Systems for Health and then the OHA uh, website for the Hospital eHealth Council, uh, where there's actually been uh, a fair number of, I think, quite good reports done uh, in terms of uh, some of these challenges and uh, some ideas on how to, uh, how to address them going forward. I was asked to give you a few key people. Uh, they're along the same lines, uh, Smart Systems, Canada Health InfoWay, and the Hospital eHealth Council. What I'd like to do now is uh, get everybody to any, any comments and questions uh, while Pat's here, and then at 10.30 we take a break, just so you know what's happening next. So. Uh, microphones or where? Yeah, he's got okay, one. Good. Last year, Dominic had a speaker in here who was a hospital executive from Boston, and he said he had 7% of his operating budget or more towards IT projects. Uh, that's a dream in Ontario. So, you know, how do you explain to the ministry that we need more money if we want to reduce wait times and be more accountable and so on? That must be a real headache for you. Well, it's it's... It's, a, it's, it's one of those issues in the accountability agreement discussion where we're going to um, have lots of conversation with the ministry. So uh, we know that balancing your budget and having a, a certain amount of working capital capacity in your hospital are seen as two of the desirables under the accountability agreement. The um, focus in the last round of accountability agreements was on reducing your administrative costs as much as possible. That's your IT budget is in there. So what the Hospital eHealth Council is doing is advocating with the ministry very strenuously and has been for a couple of years, so it hasn't uh, gone any very, very quickly, is removing IT uh, out of the administrative costs and out of the hospital funding formula uh, in order to remove the disincentive uh, and allow some of these systems to develop. Because as we all know, as long as you've got to um, put something new in before you can take out something old, you're going to have some additional costs uh, and you can't afford to have that impact on you in the funding formula. So that's what we're doing on that. It's certainly a well-recognized problem uh, and uh, um, how it's going to play out is uh, anybody's guess. Will your accountability agreements in the future take into account the shifting demographics and morbidity scales that you're going to be dealing with? For example, in a community that is consisting of elderly people and obese younger people. Uh, will the government tell you, well, you'll have to do more total knees, but it'll be done through the same budget? And do they have a plan to help you educate these younger obese people to keep their knees in better shape for a few more years? Uh, great question. Uh, the hospital funding formula is supposed to have some of those um, modifiers in it. Now, I would argue that they're... Um, they're insignificant uh, in terms of uh, the actual application of them. Uh, the um, issue about the less well population to follow uh, is something that, and one of the reasons why public health and uh, health promotion are getting such priority. There was just a new minister announced for that in Ontario. Um, certainly we've seen a minister at the federal level now for a couple of years uh, in public health. But I think that's part of where the policy answer is supposed to come. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, lack of healthy living in the generation to follow. My immediate concern is the baby boomer generation uh, because they've grown up with an immediacy to um, their needs and their attention that healthcare is not in a position to deliver. Uh, we saw them change dramatically the system of birthing as they came through that era uh, in healthcare and as they're now hitting the diseases of aging, uh, they are uh, increasingly demanding uh, immediate access to this and immediate access to that. And the decision makers are responding. I mean, that's where the wait time strategy comes from, both at a federal level and at a provincial level. This isn't being driven out of the healthcare sector saying we need more. This is being driven out of the public saying we're not prepared to wait. 
Um, so I think they'll respond to the, to the, to the uh, people that put them into, into power, um, and that's going to challenge us to be able to turn around and respond in an environment with not more money and not more people uh, in terms of making effective use of both of those. And uh, a big part of what needs to happen, in my view, is this e-health agenda in terms of supporting that. I have a, a, I guess a governance question. Um, it's always been amazing to me that hospital corporations are uh, not-for-profit independent entities that, um, uh, that the, and when every patient shows up on the doorstep, it's in fact a bad thing financially. Um, so uh, my question is, um, uh, if you do something right now that displeases the Ministry of Health, what do they do to you? And the follow-up question is, what, how will that change with Lynn's? Okay, so this is being taped. <laughs> and we have a lot of people here from the Ministry of Health. No, in, in all honesty, um, what happens r right now in terms of displeasing the ministry, um, under the Public Hospitals Act, they have all kinds of powers available to them. In fact, one would argue they didn't need Bill 8 in terms of their power to intercede in hospitals. They can put an inspector in, they can put a, a, supervi a super supervisor in, they can take out the board, they can take out the CEO. They have full latitude and power. Those decisions tend to be highly political and highly public. So where we've moved under the accountability agreement structure is to propose that uh, for disputes, uh, peer um, intervention uh, is, the, is, uh, is the first level uh, intervention. And so uh, in the latest round, out of last year's accountability agreements, uh, I think there were nine peer teams that went in to work with hospitals around, say, what other parts of the system were doing and how they might see their world a little bit differently. Um, so that tends to be the direction we're moving is more about learning and developing a, and continuous improvement as opposed to punitive reaction. Uh, and uh, I think that's very healthy. I think that's uh, 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 a direction that's going to be more helpful to the communities uh, because the reality is when you're into the punitive stuff, yeah, the hospital suffers, but big deal. But who really suffers is the community because it impacts on the delivery of healthcare to them. So traditionally and historically what would happen is they just ignore you. You want more money? Oh, okay. Yes. They just ignore you. You wouldn't get a capital approval. You wouldn't get a funding increase. You, that, that, I think, is less likely to happen as we have uh, uh, the accountability agreement structure, which says let's engage in the discussion about what really are the challenges, and then to the extent that we really can't get agreement, we'll provide some coaching and advice and support uh, and, and try and resolve the issues as opposed to punishing the community. And with LINs. Well, nobody's seen the legislation around LINs. Um, so, you know, I could guess and you could guess and we could both be totally wrong or we could both be totally right and different. Um, my hunch is that um, the LINs will have, uh, well, let me, let me restrate that. A whole, a whole bunch of what needs to happen is much more definitive planning at a local level about what is the capability and capacity. I'll use my area again as a simple example. Uh, apparently, we are one of the lowest users in long-term care of high-intensity needs funding in the province. Well, what that says to me is there's other parts of the province where long-term care is taking care of much sicker patients than is happening in my region. That's probably a big reason why I have a 17% ALC rate or alternative level of care, patients that are waiting in hospital for care that should be, be able to deliver it elsewhere based on a standard evaluation uh, mechanism. And so I think the LINs will be much more involved in working cross sectors to say, okay, how are you gonna fix that between the two of us? Uh, and then uh, coaching and monitoring to make sure that happens. And either incenting or, or having punitive action where it doesn't happen. Uh, and, uh, and that will happen through funding. Uh, and so it's gonna take a number of years for that stuff to mature. In Gray Bruce, we've now been working for four years on local health system planning across the hospitals and with the CCAC, so as the community partner, we're seeing lots of progress, but it takes real time for that stuff to happen and to actually change the systems of care on the ground. So it's not gonna be an immediate answer, um, but I think it could be very helpful in the long run. We have time for one more quick question. Any others? Maybe get the microphone here. Um, personally, I want to thank you for coming and, and, help, and 
telling us about what's going on. Um, I guess my challenge to you, be, to you and to other CEOs would be, what can you do to help solve this problem of the shortage? So you know, it's great to come to the boot camp, and uh, speaking for myself, many of us are, are new to healthcare. So how do we get some of that practical experience? What can the hospitals and the CEOs do to help further this along, take what we, we learned this week, and put it in some practical application? Because that's often what I'm finding is, you know, great, we want to hire somebody, but we want five years healthcare experience. Wait a minute, you know, there's a chicken and egg problem here. Well, it is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So part of what, what I can only speak for my own organization in terms of what we're doing, uh, uh, we're doing a little bit of grow your own in terms of who are the people that are interested in moving their careers in this direction, come from, say it's a, a lab or a DI background, and do they want to be engaged and how do we uh, work with them around growing a career. Uh, and then um, um, what we do for many areas, including this, is uh, offer experiences for students, uh, you know, so to the extent that, that that's an attractant. Uh, people tend to work where they've trained, and so we found that works for uh, healthcare uh, providers, um, so that's part of the strategy that we will be using. Um, so both career planning for our own staff and, uh, and uh, trainee uh, opportunities to uh, give people an awareness of what we're doing and, and how they might be able to be part of the future. And so by the several organizations have already done that. I uh, work with Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, who's interested in actually bringing this program in, and uh, Grand River Hospital has been a major contributor to the program, this program. So uh, one of the possibilities that hospitals have is to grab this program and use it as an internal educational tool. So that might, that might be something where it, uh, they don't have to send people out. And not quite a few people are here because their agencies have actually paid their way too. So it's a start on that. Yeah, Pat, and Dominic did use the hospital health council and the hospital distribution list in terms of yeah. this, uh, this session. So. Yeah. Pat, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure.